Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 28. As always, if you have questions that you want me to answer, then you can send them on michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's Michael with a K or send them through the Facebook Messenger widget on scientifictriathlon.com. Before we get into today's questions, big thanks to Roka for sponsoring the episode. Roka are the world leaders in wetsuits, tri suits, and other triathlon and swim apparel, and also high performance eyewear for all endurance athletes, from triathletes and cyclists all the way to speed skaters. The performance eyewear line is every bit as innovative and revolutionary as the, the wetsuits and the other products that Roka are traditionally known for, with, uh, for example, patented geeko technology that makes sure that uh, all the sunglasses really stay on your face they cannot fall off they're extremely light and comfortable to wear of course superb optical quality and now roca even has prescription glasses that uh, that you can order and they have home try on options and uh, all those sort of flexible uh, exchange and return policies that uh, you would expect from from a great company these days so check them out on roca.com and use the promo code tts all caps to get 20 percent off your order also, big thanks to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. They help, help you individualize your electrolyte intake so that you can get hydrated and stay hydrated. And they have a great team of professional athletes in triathlon, but also other individual sports and team sports that are using them because they find that the individualization of that hydration strategy is helping them perform better. And uh, some of these athletes that you have definitely heard of are Ben Canute, Michelle Dillon, Stuart Hayes, and Sarah Lewis, among others. And the way that Precision Hydration can work for you is you just go and take a quick quiz on the PH website, so precisionhydration.com. That will give you a ballpark estimate for how much electrolytes you need to replace in training and racing. And the Precision Hydration will make a recommendation for how to go about getting in those electrolytes. So then you can get your first box for free with the promo code that travel show, all one word, all caps. And again, the URL is precisionhydration.com. All right, so on to today's questions. The first one is uh, from G in Seattle, who writes uh, that uh, swimming was my first sport as a child. I swam from 6 through 11 years old. I have ran just uh, run just two half marathons, 2017 being the most recent. I have no background in cycling. Uh, my goal is to do my first sprint triathlon this August. Uh, I really can only afford to train four times a week for about 1.5 hours per session. All the training programs that I have seen require more days of training than that. Is there a way I can prep myself to do a sprint triathlon only training four times per week? If so, what would that look like? All right, thanks for your question, G. Sure, you can absolutely do that. And the great advantage that you have is that you have a fairly long time window for those workouts of 1.5 hours. So make that work to your at your advantage by including double sessions in that time window. That's my main recommendation here. Uh, so when training for a sprint, like the goal should be to get in at least two workouts per week per discipline. So so two swims, uh, two bikes, and two runs typically. Uh, however, in your case, with a swimming background and only four workouts per week, as you'll see in my suggested schedule, uh, I break that rule in, in this particular situation and suggest that you might do only one swim uh, per week. Uh, because also that allows you then to really focus on your bike, which you have no background in, and that is uh, the longest segment of the triathlon. So... So here we go. How how to break down the sessions? It depends a little bit on logistics and and also on how ready you are to introduce some quality workouts. So for example, moderate to high intensity intervals rather than just steady endurance in your schedule. But I'll give it a go with with a suggestion here. So first, I would definitely keep one of those ninety minute workouts as a long steady bike ride to just build endurance. And ideally, you could go out on the roads and ride a hilly route to work on strength, even though you're not trying to push it, you're not trying to make it a hard workout, but but you get some sort of natural uh, strength building efforts in there. 
Then the second workout, I suggest that you do a bike run brick workout. So this is very traditional. And uh, in this case, I would probably do some quality work on the bike. So moderate or high intensity intervals. And you might spend an hour on the bike and then do a 30 minute run off the bike, which for the most part can be easy, I would say. But maybe the, the few weeks, the months or so before the race, you start to do that brick run with race intensity not necessarily as a continuous race intensity effort but race intensity intervals and uh, so there you go there you have two bikes already Uh, but then i'd actually recommend a run bike brick workout as well so this of course is not for any specific reason because you're not cycling after running in a triathlon but this is because i wanted to get in a quality run you have done two half marathons so you definitely have a running background so, so you can get in like a 40 to 45 minute run and this run can have some moderate to high intensity in it and be your quality run for the week. And that's why I have the run first, not second, because I wanted to do that quality run on fresh legs. So then after doing that run, get in from the run and then just jump, jump on the bike trainer or just bring the bike out of the garage and go for a, a 45 minute steady endurance, uh, nothing, nothing hard. Uh, just just endurance zone two type of work and and do that and this is all to get in some more bike volume since you have no background and, and this is definitely where you should have the most time to gain on the bike so now you actually have three bikes already uh, because because of the use of these sort of various brick variations so finally the fourth workout i would suggest uh, either a long swim including a main set maybe some race intensity intervals or it could also be a one hour swim followed by a 30 minute very easy run. And especially if you feel that you also have a lot of improvements to do on the run side of things, which uh, um, you might have. Uh, I, I think that probably you do actually. So my recommendation might actually be to, to do that second option. So do the one hour swim followed by a 30 minute very easy run because a one hour swim will, will still allow you to do a lot of, of good, good swimming have some technique work, have some quality work like intervals and then get in some more run volume as well. And and as you said, you have a background in swimming and it is the shortest part of the race with only four workouts per week. I am definitely deprioritizing it here in this particular situation. Uh, you will get through it, no problem. So, so that's why the focus here in this suggestion is more so on the bike especially, but also on the run side of things. However, if you do want to absolutely do uh, two swims per week, then what I would recommend that you do is to still do this uh, this long swim or swim run transition workout that I just talked about, but uh, then exchange the run bike workout where you would start with a quality run and then go for an, a steady endurance ride. Uh, I would exchange that for a run swim with the same sort of structure. So you first do your hard run on fresh legs and then immediately after that you end up at the pool and uh, you do an easier technique focused swim right after running. So I guess uh, that wraps it up and to summarize you can absolutely do great training for your sprint triathlon with the time limitations that you have. But you definitely need to become good at workout logistics and and making these sorts of workout transitions work for you and work to your advantage. So I hope that this helps, G. The next question is from Justin in Ohio. And he writes, uh, Hi Michael, after listening to a couple of specific episodes about time management and planning and also feeling overwhelmed personally with training, work commitments and my own poor time management, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, as a background, I got into triathlon in 2017. A co-worker who had been doing triathlons for the past 25 years loosely coached me. I was doing 9-10 to 10 workouts per week, crashed miserably a few times from exhaustion, but I completed three sprints uh, with the first race finished in a time of 1 hour 19 minutes. I then decided to train for a 7.3 in 2018, and the bulk of my training was three workouts per discipline, 5,500 yards swimming, 85 miles biking, and 25 miles running per week. Uh, With an approach of this is what you have to do and make it work around your life, I did finish the 7.3 in 5 hours 45 minutes, but that was with the swim cut short to 400 yards. 
So my questions, you've talked about volume versus frequency and that consistency is vitally important. My question is based around this. If an athlete is supposed to achieve 25 miles of running for the week, which is better? Uh, for example, three runs of 10 miles, 8 miles and 7 miles or five runs of nine, five, four, four, and three miles. And how would this change for a 70.3? All right, so here comes the answer. And uh, it is, it depends. <laughs> uh, so the more of a beginner level that you are at, the more I think that frequency trumps duration, uh, the duration of individual workouts. And especially with running, I would say that this is the case because it can be very risky when you do long runs and, and a 10 mile run that can really spell disaster for a lot of more beginner athletes. But I, I would say that even for many mid pack triathletes, the latter option and focusing more on frequency, uh, that can potentially be better. It does require that you learn how to be super efficient with your transitions and your logistics so getting changed before and after and shower but actually you can get it down it's an art and you can get it down to almost per perfection if you if you are focused and that's definitely what uh, what i've learned to do because uh, i'm also struggling to get in my training of course i train at a fairly high volume but uh, it's a struggle for me to to get the, the volume that i want in so i need to i cannot waste any time uh either so so it's it's something that you need to practice to not waste time when getting changed getting getting changed back after workout and showering etc so so you need to work on that but if you do then the time waste is minimal and in that case doing more frequent runs can be beneficial even for the mid-pack triathlete i i would say because it's amazing what you can do with those five runs even though they may seem short and insignificant on paper but let's take your example the first run the nine mile run that would be your long run steady endurance nothing nothing really hard about it then we have a five mile run and that could be a tempo run so one mile warm-up four mile tempo then we have the four mile run and that could uh, function very well as like a fart lake run or some sort of high intensity intervals so a one mile warm-up again and then three miles with those high intensity intervals or the fart lake segment so that works brilliantly and then the four and three mile easy runs that are left would be easy runs potentially off the bike they would save you even more time and also allow you to of course practice running off the bike for 70.3 when training for that i definitely think that as you get closer to the race let's say about two months out that's when i would start to build up that long run and then you might drop first to four runs per week and then three runs per week to allow for uh, that long run to, to increase in duration if you're limited to, to running 25 miles per week. Uh, so, of course, you could also just increase the, the long run and keep the other runs the same. But, uh, but this is a hypothetical example and we're talking about what is more important. And when you get closer to a longer race, like a 7.3, then the duration of the individual workout starts to potentially become more important than the frequency and the, of, of the workouts. So how often you do them. So to sum up, earlier in the season, frequency is probably more important. Later on, especially when training for long races, then the longer runs are more important. All right, so back to Justin's questions. And uh, question B here, as uh, he writes it, is... Training time versus training mileage. I often hear it discussed how much athletes can train per week in terms of hours, like 6, 10, 15 hours per week. What's more important, training for hours or training for mileage? So this is, in my opinion, 100% training for time, not for distance or mileage. Like It depends so much on the terrain where you live and, and how fast you are, <laughs> put simply. Distance is just a byproduct of the time that you put in. And uh, to give you an example here, think of somebody running their recovery runs at 4 minutes 30 seconds per kilometer. So that would be somewhere around about, I, I don't know, 640 per mile pace, something like that, versus a beginner doing their recovery runs at 8 minutes 30 seconds per uh, per kilometer which would then be probably something like 12 13 minute miling uh, if uh, yeah that's a very rough estimate but but it gives you an idea that it's uh, it's almost 
half the speed, uh, 430 versus 830 in kilometer. So a five kilometer recovery run for the fast athlete would take less than 25 minutes, which is totally fine for a recovery run, one of your easy low volume runs getting in frequency. But for the beginner athlete, it would take 45 minutes, which uh, for a runner of that speed uh, or lack of speed, uh, to be honest, that really isn't recovery, regardless of if they're going slow enough. But when you're a beginner of that level, then running for 45 minutes, even if it's at a super low intensity, it, it is taxing. So, so it completely changes the whole outcome and the objective of the workout. If you train to running five kilometers versus running, let's say, 25 minutes. Uh, so, so that's a great example of, of why you should not train to distance. Definitely not. And uh, this is something that I think is uh, pretty bad, especially in in running. A lot of plans I think are traditionally written in in distance, and and that's I think something that needs to needs to change. Uh, put simply, swimming I would say is perhaps a bit different in that it's just more practical and easier to plan it according to distance. But even then, you still should consider how long the swim will take you. So, for example, if you're time crunched and uh, you, you don't have that much time, then don't pl- plan to do five kilometer swims if it will take you one hour, 45 minutes to complete it. That's, that's a waste of time. Uh, if you do have a lot of time and want to improve your swimming, sure, it might make sense to do a long swim like that. But uh, let's say that you're, you're doing three swims per week, as you said that you have been doing in the past and you're training for a 70.3. Uh, then I would say that's a fantastic distribution of swimming time would be to do one slightly longer swim that takes you one hour, 15 minutes to complete, one mid-range swim that takes you one hour, and one shorter swim which takes you 45 minutes to complete. That, that would be a fantastic way to distribute your swimming time. And then you can just plan the distances roughly, it doesn't have to be perfect, that it will take you to, to finish those sorts of durations. So maybe it is 3,500 meters, 3,000 meters, and 2,500 meters, or whatever it is for you. But uh, but still, definitely considering that duration before actually planning out the distance is important even in the swim. Next question here, still from Justin. Uh, Justin writes, you mentioned about a lot of athletes train, training at 4 a.m. when the family is still sleeping. How does this work with uh, biking and swimming uh, that early in the morning? And also sleeping. If you want 8 to 10 hours of sleep per night, then one would have to go to sleep by 6 or 8 p.m. And I don't see how that really helps with family time. You can't bike outside during this time of of day, so it's trainer only. And swimming, the facility might not be open that early. Uh, So, um, yeah, uh, to answer those things, I I think that 4 a.m. is very early. And I don't, maybe I mentioned that some people train that early, but I don't think that a lot of people train that early. And, and it's certainly not recommended if you can if you can start training a bit later because that that is very early. Uh, but uh, I do think that a lot of people start training between five thirty or six thirty or so, and because that still leaves plenty of time for training, and uh, and you can get a good amount of sleep. If you go to bed at ten and get up at five, you still get seven hours, for example, which actually is enough for for a lot of people. Although you don't want to necessarily go lower in sleep duration than that on a regular basis, but but seven hours can it can be good enough. And and the research shows that actually that for adults, seven to nine hours per 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 night is uh, is the sort of the recommended window. And then there are individual variations that some people actually they don't feel that they have slept enough on seven hours. So so you need to to get to know your body and your needs your sleep needs to find out how early you need to go to bed but if you if you go to bed at 10 and get up at 5 and get 7 hours then that's i don't think is uh, unreasonable and that that's what a lot of of age group athletes do and of course i would say that it's uh, preferable if you have the option to start training at 6:30 rather rather than 5:30 because it gives you just a little bit more time to sleep uh, and uh, so if you can get a workout in at 6.30 and still have time to take the kids to school or and get to work or whatever you need to do, then definitely go for that. But uh, but if 5.30 is what you have to do, then uh, yes, do that and get to bed as early as needed to for you to feel feel recovered enough. And that might be 10 
it might even be 10 30 it might be nine uh, but uh, I, I would say for most most athletes 9 30 to 10 would still put them in a good place to to be well rested if they have good quality sleep I, it's important to remember that it's not just about uh, the quantity of sleep but it's equally about the quality of the sleep uh, which can be affected by a lot of things so that's a topic for for another another day but if you get in seven hours of quality sleep then that uh, that is a really good starting point for most uh, as for biking that early yes <laughs> trainer work is definitely the way to go uh, but even even if uh, the light outside wasn't an issue then trainer work is probably the best solution for time effective bike training so so that's not a bad thing i don't think the real key again with these early morning workouts is to become a master of logistics and transitions as we talked about already before in this in this episode so prepare everything in advance the evening before for example packing your swim bag your post-workout nutrition laying out your clothes both the training clothes and and your change have everything ready ready to go and uh, and work it to perfection because the, you can improve a lot that you might not think possible and and really get some time off from from these transitions so to say so as an example when when i've had early morning swim squad workouts i always uh, used to like when i get dressed I, d- I dress in my speedos right away and then pull my jeans over them and and uh, and then just commute to the pool that way so when i get get to the locker room there's really there's one changing step less uh, because i already have my speedos on i just uh, pull off my jeans i can essentially undress while walking into the locker room and barely even stop before walking out to the pool area it's like a 10 second operation so hope hope this doesn't paint a too vivid picture by the way but but that's a small change that you can make but there are thousands of changes like that that add up together to make you become a master of these transitions and logistics another example that i've used is to prepare a post-workout smoothie that would be very like it would have a lot of energy so and the post-workout nutrients that i need so after a hard bike workout uh, it's it's also my my breakfast for so so i get enough energy i get the carbohydrates and the protein that i need i prepare it the night before put it in the fridge and uh, bring it in a bottle to next to my bike for my morning trainer workout then in the last five minutes or so when i'm usually warming down for a little bit then i consume the smoothie then and there on the bike while still pedaling so then i don't need to first of all i don't need to prepare anything after that bike workout it's already prepared but also i don't even need to uh, go to the shower change and then get into the kitchen and, and have my breakfast but i've actually already had my breakfast and I can just shower, change, and then go and do whatever I need to to do next. So this, again, so saves you another five minutes or so. And these things, they do add up. So I would encourage you to really uh, be creative with, with how you can manage time here. So the next part of Justin's question is, uh, I briefly looked at your training plans and was amazed that even the intermediate sprint plan only had six workouts per week on average. And I think maxed out at about eight and a half to nine hours per week. So yeah, that's a comment more than a question. But uh, yes, yeah, so my thinking when I do these training plans, it's it's not based on what is ideal for like somebody who wants to maximize their potential because that would mean training 25 hours per week after you get to a certain level, even if it's a sprint triathlon. Uh, it is based on what the average intermediate age grouper can realistically do. Of course, for most people, it's uh, it would be better if you can train slightly more than that. But but it's really not reality from what I've seen and the feedback that I'm getting. Uh, so uh, so that's the way that they're structured. If somebody is using the plans and they want to add uh, not hard workouts but add more endurance workouts to the plan, then that's absolutely beneficial if you feel that you can still recover well and perform in in all your workouts the, the way that you're supposed to so uh, yeah uh, that's uh, and this goes for any training plan you follow i think not just mine that if you have time to add a bit more base endurance miles or distance or duration <laughs> a duration i guess because we all just discussed that then uh, that's usually a good thing to do but uh, i think that you s- when you create a training plan you need to start from a point of what is uh, typically achievable like something that that the user can actually achieve on a week in week out basis and that's why on average those 
intermediate sprint plans. Uh, of course, the Ironman plans and the half Ironman plans even have have more workouts than that. But the sprint plan, it you can get away with just six workouts per week and and still perform uh, at a fairly decent level. Then the final part of Justin's questions is, is that uh, I also heard on one of your episodes. Someone say that training only one hour per day can be sufficient for sprints and still allow you to be extremely competitive. Um, so, okay, so that uh, ties very nicely into what I just said. It is true in a way, but it, to be extremely competitive, it all depends on how we define that, of course, but to be fighting for podiums in your age group, for example, I would say that you can't do this from scratch on one hour of training per day. But if you have a strong base, maybe you've been swimming or running in college, or you have a longer background in endurance sports in the past, even if you have been inactive for the last year or two, then then you can probably then you have have a chance of becoming extremely competitive even on just one hour per day, because it's so much easier to get back to a level that you have once been at compared to building up to that level in the first place. So for somebody with no solid background in endurance sports at all. I, I would say that it's quite unlikely that you would become extremely competitive if you train one hour per day, even for a sprint distance, uh, or at the very least, it would take several years of training one hour per day every single day, like Michael Phelps, although it was much more than one hour for him, but but just being very consistent. Um, by the way, I'm kidding with every single day. Of course, some strategic rest days would be probably useful to have in there. Uh, but uh, let's say that you have a, a scenario where you would train for 12 to 15 hours per week for three years. That would be enough for most to become very competitive at the sprint distance. Very, very, very competitive. Then you can have a year off and you become lazy and <laughs> lazy and, and slow again. Uh, but And if you come back then after that year off, then you could come back to fairly close to that peak fitness that you had even with just one hour per day of training after you've done that for, for some time. Because it is, again, so much easier to build back up to a level that you have once been at compared to building up to that level in the first place, which for becoming competitive at sprint distance, I would say if you're starting from scratch, you don't have that background already in you then you would require more than one hour per day to become extremely competitive. So I hope that answers your questions, Justin. And this wraps it up for today. Uh, keep sending in those questions. I'll link in the, in the episode description to four episodes that are sort of related to the topics that we've discussed today with time management and getting effective return on training investment. And these are episodes 134, 92, 37, and 10. So those are interviews with AJ Johnson, Kate Roberts, Amy Farrell, and then number 10 was a, so a solo episode. Also, since uh, Justin mentioned my training plans, I thought I'd mention them again uh, because it's been a while since I mentioned them. Remember that on scientifictriathlon.com, I have uh, quite a few training plans that uh, you can check out if you're interested in training for a sprint, Olympic, half, or full distance triathlon. Uh, so check that out. And uh, I want to read an email that I got in just the other day, actually. And I was reminded of, reminded of it when Justin mentioned my training plans. So this email read, uh, Michael, before doing your program, which I followed to the letter, I hadn't run farther than three kilometers. I hadn't ever swum in the sea and I hadn't ridden a bike for 20 years. After three months of following your beginner Olympic plan, I completed my first Olympic distance triathlon in three hours, 29 minutes. I'm 40 years old. I work full time and I have two very young children. Thanks for making this possible, Fiona. So thank you so much, Fiona, for that feedback. I really, really appreciate it. It warms my heart to hear that. And uh, that, that is an example, another example of, uh, I guess, time effective training. That program, the beginner Olympic distance program, it doesn't have a lot of training to it, but it has enough so that people that are beginners and typically aren't as invested in spending 10 or 15 hours on training, it's unrealistic, they can still follow that program and, as Fiona did, follow it to the letter and that will get them to the finish line very happily and uh, smiling, even though they have no background at all and or, or a very weak base to, to start from. 
So big thanks before we go to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Remember to take your free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com and use the promo code that Traflon show, all one word, all caps, to get your first box for free. And thank you to Roka for sponsoring the episode. If you are looking for wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, check it out on roka.com and use the promo code TTS, all caps, to get 20% off your entire order. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.